When we look around us in the natural world, you know, there's these amazing examples of collective intelligence that seem to arise from very, very simple individuals that are working together. And starting with the example that he said, you know, ant colonies are just this amazing example, very annoying example <laughs> sometimes, but they search through these huge territories for food, making these trails that are like super highways to, to get to the different food sources that they want. And if the food source is too big, they can actually even work together to move it around, whatever that thing is. And if they're annoying people, they can get around what the annoying people do to them too. <laughs> and it's not just ants. Bee colonies do this as well. They do it in the air instead of the ground. Uh, and one of the other examples that I find particularly exciting is the way groups of insects can build. So these huge termite mounds that are 10 meters high in Australia and Namibia are built by just centimeter scale insects that are working together, moving little pieces of mud and creating this system that is huge and self-repairing, uh, which is really an amazing example. You think of bird flocks or fish schools, I'm sure this is something many of you here might have witnessed firsthand, is how they seem to move. You come close to them and it's like they turn on a dime. So who's in charge? <laughs> who's in charge in any of these systems? It's so fascinating to watch this collective behavior come together. For me, I think there are three reasons why I find these systems really striking. So one of the first reasons is that when you look at an individual, it seems so tiny, so small compared to the sheer size of the swarm. And it seems mind-boggling that this group can coordinate at all when one individual that's at one end can't understand what's going on with another individual at the under, other end. So how, how is it that they coordinate? And they do coordinate really well, and the other sort of striking feature is it seems that they coordinate without leaders. So there's no single fish that is telling the swarm to turn or telling the school which way to go. There's no ant that says this is where the trail should be and these are the food sources we should exploit. Somehow, instead, there's a more self-organized process that these systems emerge from lots of individuals, somewhat democratically, running these really simple rules. And from these simple rules comes a, an intelligence that really only emerges at the group level. And this, I think, is just a really powerful idea that individuals could be limited, uh, could have limited knowledge, and yet, by getting together in numbers, we would have this power in numbers. So, what if we could build our own artificial collectives this way? What if we could build systems where we didn't have to build the perfect individual, we could build an agent that was simple and just make lots of them, and somehow, together, without any you know, supreme leader, these agents would be able to do things we want. Not just do things that already exist in nature, but do something new for us. So for example, coming back to my termites, what if we could build robots that could build structures much larger than themselves and could do it just like the termites build these mounds and nests, except they would build you what you want. I'm, I'm not sure if you want the Eiffel Tower, <laughs> um, but it seemed appropriate. So what would it take to create these kind of artificial collectives? So when we started this project, we were faced with two different problems. One is creating even just one individual that is close to what a termite is capable of doing. So making one robot that can build and move around. And it actually turns out just that is still a grand challenge for AI. We're really struggling to even arrive at the, the intelligence that an animal has. So we'll make our robots and they'll be somewhat limited. And then the second challenge is, once we have this limited robot, how does it cooperate with others so that it can achieve an intelligence, achieve a property that is so much more than what that individual robot can do? How can I have hundreds of robots collaborate? So the interesting thing is that, of course, you know, when we're thinking about simple rules for robots, it's not actually the case that somebody understands what the simple rules are that operate in termites. We don't actually know that. What we do know is that termites seem to actually cooperate without talking, which is an unusual feature. So instead of termites meeting each other and discussing what they're going to build, they can actually react to things in their environment. So they might see a building pattern and react to that and decide what to build. And the interesting thing is that once they build, they influence what others will, will do instead. 
So now you're communicating using the environment as a form of communication. And this is really useful because now they can operate in distances really far from each other, and they can work together and build these incredible mounds and even repair them when the environment changes by simply looking at building patterns. So we started this project to build robots that could cooperate in the same kind of way. And our first challenge, as I said, was making a single robot. So our single robot has to do one important thing, which is move. So it needs to move over different terrains, and it needs to be able to climb over th the things it builds. So we built a robot that climbs over stairs, and it builds stairs. And by building stairs and climbing over the stairs and building bigger stairs, it can build its own structures. So it climbs, and it picks up material with its, with its claw, as you can see here. Now you'll see it pick up um, piece and place it down, and we start to create this single robot that can do all the actions that are necessary. And one of the things you'll notice is that as it's placing this block, um, this robot actually has trouble doing it. So it's slightly slipping, it's moving, it's turning, and this is where the intelligence comes in. So how does it sense what it's doing and sense of the world? So our robot has lots of different sensors. It has pattern sensors, so it can see the patterns on the block. That's how it sort of navigates through its world, knowing where it is. Uh, it has distance sensors, so it can feel if there are obstacles in its way. It has a tilt sensor, so it has a sense of balance. It has a touch sensor, so that it knows when it's picked up or let go of a block correctly. And when you put all of this intelligence together, we get a robot that sort of is beginning to approach the autonomy that we think any ant actually already has. It can climb up the structure that was built by someone else, it can carry things in it, it can place it, and it can climb over the things it built. So the next step is, what are the rules? How do you get a bunch of these robots to actually cooperate? And one of the things we discovered was that we can actually design our own rules. So if you gave me a picture of a structure that you wanted, there is actually a way to systematically come up with rules that all of the robots, if they ran together, would produce the structure. And the interesting thing about these rules is that they can use the same ideas that I was telling you with the termites. So each individual robot comes to the structure, and it actually just looks for building patterns. It's looking for somewhere to build, and it has to find somewhere to build, but it doesn't really know how many other robots they are or where the other ones are. They're just constantly reacting to things built by other individuals in their colony. So this is a simulation, and here is our single robot actually running uh, the program. So the, this is sped up, if it's probably obvious. Um, so the robot walks around the structure, it looks for the landing strip, and it gets on, gets a block, and then goes and looks for a pattern that says, here's a good place to build. So it's sort of looking at things that are already built. Now, suppose the structure gets destroyed. Well, each time the termite actually comes, our termite robot comes, it doesn't actually have a memory of what's been done in the past. It's just looking for local building patterns. So if another termite comes and builds, it can also take advantage of that nice situation and continue to build. And in this way, these rules have a really nice, robust property. They're actually very, very reactive. And both destruction and addition seem to be able to, you know, be able to be dealt with this one robot. So here you see our final system. We have three robots, uh, Isis, Nargan, and Kali. And they're working together to build what is supposed to be their own castle. And, um, the interesting thing is, of course, each of them is completely unaware of the other robots in the process. It's really just each robot is its own individual building it on top of the actions of the other robots. Now, this is still a really simple system, and maybe it might surprise you to think that it took us four years from the point where we thought we were going to do this to get here. But if we imagine other kinds of robot bodies, robots moving sandbags, robots moving beams. We can imagine these cooperative groups building things that we really care about in the environment and building the way we think an animal intelligence should be able to do. I showed you three robots, um, which of course is a far cry from the collectives I was showing you at the beginning. If, we, if you thought of the fish or the ants, there's thousands of them working together. And if you go even smaller, like if you think about a cell inside an organism, these are cells with identical DNA that are cooperating to create a complex organism like a starfish. So even a cell is part of a collective. So what if 
we could create our own collectives of this scale. So what would it be like to, for example, not have three robots, but have, say, a thousand robots? Right? That would be pretty cool. Um, well, certainly any one robot is actually not going to be as sophisticated as the Termes robots that I showed you before. So we have to sort of make them a lot simpler. In fact, I have one right here. So this is a project uh, that was inspired by this idea that if we have a thousand robots, then we can start to mimic the kind of ideas that we see in nature. We can start to understand better how those rules operate. And maybe we can start to generate our own rules. So here's a single robot, and here's what a single robot can do. A single robot can move, so it can use these vibration motors, kind of like what you have in your cell phone, to move straight left and right. It can talk with its neighbors through a simple wireless system where it talks to just a couple of neighbors. And every robot has its own computer. So now we can program the group of robots with whatever simple rules we want, simple rules that we think, for example, might come from nature. We could start to look at those kinds of rules. So show you an example here. So for example, if you think about fireflies, you can program each robot to flash its light as if it was a firefly and start to pay attention to what its neighbors are doing and change its flashing. And eventually, the whole group can actually synchronize their flashing, just the way like an audience starts to clap together all of a sudden in a self-organized way, we can actually recreate those programs on our robots. We can think also about pattern formation, so how is it that cells in an embryo form patterns? So here on the left-hand side, there's, this is a whole field of 1,000 robots, and on the left is a single robot that's emitting some information, and the other robots are forming a stripe-like pattern based on how the information is flowing through the system. So depending on how far you are, you might take a different color. We can program collective motion. So motion in uh, small groups. <laughs> Anyone seen this before? <laughs> motion in large groups. Uh, and this video I, I really like to show because you know, we made these robots, these are not ants, and they're identical and we gave them identical rules, but they don't behave identically. They really behave with the variation that we really think of as having natural systems. So, one of the things that I said in the beginning that excited me about having a thousand robots was really trying to create new kinds of collective behavior. What are artificial collective behaviors that have never existed <laughs> in nature? Um, ones that you and I get to invent. Uh, so can I invent a program so that these robots self-organize into a starfish shape? Well, we can. And actually, the interesting thing is that the program that we use to self-organize something like a complex shape is the same program that combines things from before, like synchronization, movement, pattern formation. You put those together, and you can actually make much more complicated programs that combine those different behaviors. So here, each individual robot doesn't actually know where it's going to end up in the shape. There's no leader, there's no overhead camera. Each robot talks to 10 neighboring robots. But as a group, they're actually able to form a pattern that all of them know is the goal, but none of them know which role they're going to play. So this is just showing uh, some close-ups of that. And so you can sort of see what the size of the robot is in my hand, uh, or maybe not, or maybe afterwards you guys will see some. And you know, it begins to sort of look like these pattern formation and individuals moving around together. And maybe in the future we'll be able to shrink the size of these robots so that we would think of these really as programmable materials that just sort of, like a 3D printer, you could take a box of this and they'd morph into whatever shape you want. Or maybe they could be larger ones, robots that could self-organize into bridges or self-organize into beams if need be. Um, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of science fiction around trying to think about what kinds of things we could do. But one of the things that makes me most excited to watch this video is that you sort of forget that there is a bot altogether. It starts to look like just one entity. Um, it starts to really look like a collective. And I think that that's getting us closer to that idea that we can create the kind of artificial systems that fascinate us in nature. What will future collectives look like? Well, this is up to you know, invention. I, I don't know, and there are many challenges that we have to solve. But there's so many environments where we could think about um, robotics or think about the role of robotics, uh, think about the role of artificial collectives, whether it's monitoring our ocean environments or growing our food, or in the future, you know, when we have all these electric vehicles with self-driving capabilities, we're going to have highways full of robots. So 
How are these robots going to be programmed? What do we understand about collective behaviors? So this becomes very important. And I think that you know, many of this today is science fiction, but the internet is an amazing collective of very small computers, if you think about it. And that was once science fiction. So where is this going to lead us next, I think, is anybody's guess. So what can thousands of individuals do together? The last thing I'd like to say is, of course, there are many things that we can do together, but science is one of them. And sometimes these talks give the impression, I think, that the person who stands here is the person who invented it. But that's not at all how it works. My own talents are pretty limited, you know, and I think that many of you might feel, as I do, that you know, if it just relied on the knowledge I have, I didn't even know I wanted to do robotics. I, I didn't realize that until I was past 30. So what happens when you don't have all of the talent or all of the knowledge required or even all of the courage that it takes to try something wild and crazy? Well, you look to your own collective. And I have had an amazing experience to work with incredibly talented people who bring their talents as well as their limitations to the table. And as a collective, we're able to transcend completely what any one of us can do. And I think that most important scientific discoveries are that way. Now, are there simple rules that make us work better together as collectives? That I don't have an answer for you. And I have to admit, we experiment with new rules every so often in my group to try and figure this out. But I do think that solving any new scientific discoveries, solving climate change, building the next energy solution, all the things that you hear at this, at this TED Talk, those are things that are not solved by individual talent. It's collective talent. My talent your talent, um, and all of our collectives. So I hope you find the collective that best fits, fits your talent and, and think about bringing to your community all of the interesting things that I'm sure you all are thinking of. All right, thank you.